contrasting the word of God with empirical observations. 2 Timothy 3.6, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and to all good works. Genesis 3.22, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Numerous verses of the Bible on what may be viewed as having cosmological relevance can be interpreted without logically necessarily standing out in contradiction to contemporary empirical scientific insights and observations of ancient ideas regarding cosmology that may have been associated with scriptural values. Some people sought to use the Bible as a scientific text for explaining otherwise unexplained cosmological phenomena. Treating the Bible as a scientific text was in itself given as an instruction in the Bible. Where the Bible does mention or refer to empirical structures, it does so in a way such that the reference object paradigm may be visualized with numerous different paradigmata contingent upon the state of learning of the reader. The way some traditionalists interpret select reference object paradigms in scripture may be more in conflict with biblical meaning than select misinterpretations of contemporary science. I am not preaching to the choir. I will examine the depth and limits of temporal human knowledge and show that it does not convert, controvert, nor transcend sacred scripture and the veracity of its physical paradigms. I write with the belief that any intelligent reader, even the lost, could agree that the observable universe is God's creation or the lesser proposition that nothing in the observable universe precludes God's having created it, even if one believes it's a quantum computer. For many, faith in God and the Lord Jesus Christ have been shaken by scientific development, technology, and theory, so much so that government seems to encourage change to move beyond Christian thought. In this thesis, I will show that contemporary science, cosmology, and evolution have not controverted the truth of the Holy Bible. Conversely, modern physics and quantum cosmology theory provide advanced theoretical points of support for theological opinion concerning the nature of God and the reality of his method for reconciliation of the elect into his will. Christology of John and the Logos exemplify the universal and transcending ideas of the apostles about Jesus Christ and that God may be juxtaposed with pre-Big Bang cosmological speculation about a timeless state before time and light were issued in an expanding universe that grew like a great tree with many branches for all manner of things to live in. The Lord Jesus Christ did not necessarily mean everything he said literally. That is, he spoke in parables and used figures of speech. Consider not only lilies regard the use of the word mountain in Mark 11.23 where it may be taken to be metaphor. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Mountains may be regarded as large spiritual issues. The Christian is challenged to overcome, rather than taking the meaning of mountain literally as if Mount Everest could be cast into the Indian Ocean. It may be interpreted as descriptive, of social and spiritual challenges from small to the largest, often within the Christian. That criterion is interesting to the philosophical that are interested in epistemology, the theory of knowledge. That field advanced quite a lot in the 20th century. Empiricism was surpassed by Quine, Strauss, and various analytic philosophers. Yet existentialism and the problem of self-verifying knowledge that is expressed in the problem of solipsism persisted and had a counterpart in the division of knowledge in the categories of internal and external or intentional and extensional that hadn't been addressed sharply enough by empiricism. The origins of the epistemological criterion was in Kant's critique of pure reason. Jesus Christ said, in effect, that epistemological and content of consciousness issues of whatever size may be overcome with faith as the Christian is joined to the primary monistic field of the universe, or kingdom of God through the grace of the Lord Jesus, it follows that subjective spiritual or psychological problems are eclipsed, as well as the power of significance of temporal problematic material objects with faith in the primary monistic field creator. The contingent field problems fade away or perhaps vacated 
Christians may interpret cosmological end times events from different perspectives depending upon what sort of hermeneutics they use. Pre-tribulationists may interpret John's revelation symbolism differently than post-tribulationists. One can in turn interpret symbolism of the revelation differently even within a pre-trib hermeneutic. J. Vernon McGee commented in a radio lecture that this is the age of the Church of Smyrna when he was commenting on the revelation. Post-tribulationists, a.k.a. post-millennialists, would find that off nearly 2,000 years more or less if taken literally. Yet McGee may have meant that people of the day behave like the people of the Church of Smyrna. In that case, the description is appropriate diagnostically for today as well as it was in John's day. In this book, I consider biblical meanings for eschatology from pre-trib and post-trib paradigms and extrapolate even farther within those traditions in addition to considering what end times referent terms mean within a scientific point of view. Darwinism lies in opposition to a veritable pre-Newtonian science paradigm used by Christian fundamentalists for interpreting the book of Genesis. Biology is in physics, of course, and creation content of Genesis is not limited to biology. It is useful to say that words are representational and that actual historical physical cosmology and its, its mechanics were different from the words describing the creative acts of Genesis. The words are abstract and can be interpreted with the understanding of idiots or geniuses in their own way. It is difficult for a human being to imagine a God so great as to understand every thought of every human being alive and to pre-know the location of every quantum particle, its destiny and purpose, even virtual particles, in accomplishing the providence of God amidst all of the force fields that will ever be. It is challenging to understand how such a God who has always existed before any universe existed can care about the lives of the people he has allowed to exist in his creation, yet he does. The Lord Jesus Christ has appeared as a human being in order to bring the elect into eternal life with God. The Lord atoned for humanity's condition of sin, pervasive of an original that made all human works unacceptable, paying the debt of sin for those of faith. Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice unto God, given by God. It is difficult to understand how God cared so much for humanity as to sacrifice his son, except to know that is what love is. There is room for speculating about how cosmological mechanics creating the universe actualized in themselves rather than as images inferred from verbal descriptions in Genesis. Consider that if a teenager provided a few hundred words about how a trip to Africa was, for example, it might be difficult to actually get an accurate idea of what the teenager experienced, such that one could paint a picture of it with as much accuracy, at least as photographs would have provided. Was the biblical flood local in Mesopotamia, or did it cover the whole earth? Did earth not just mean land or dirt in the ancient past? Does a flood story of water covering the land require interpretation to mean that the entire planet was covered under flood water? in an age when no one knew the world was around. Would anyone reading Genesis in Solomon's court have given a thought about a round planet being covered with water? Would the flood story have meant that to Solomon? Scientific theories are less than concise, exhaustible, infallible records of the history and future of reality. Theories change with seasons of new understanding and our descriptions of the way physical forces are happening now and of ways they may have happened in the past. A Big Bang may have occurred, yet alternatively membranes may have collided like clanging cymbals, sending energizing vibrations into quantum reality. Or the entire universe could be exist on, as an event horizon on a five-dimensional black hole. Multiverse theory is a universe itself of theories of creation that are subject to the will of spirit to shape a universal or multi-universal field in the beginning to a destined form. Divine mechanics are beyond the reach of even the most accurate fundamental theory a human or computer mind could create. All points in space-time may already exist in eternity for God. One ought not to limit oneself to using Dark Ages scientific interpretations for understanding Genesis. God is not limited to such means and methods as were understood by 12th century scientists or those of the 21st century. 
Post-tribulationists, also known as post-millennialists, believe the end times events of the Revelation mostly occurred in the first century. I agree. Biblical eschatology is a field misunderstood by millions of Christians and non-believers. The Revelation mostly describes the end time of the era before the kingdom of God arrived through the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first century, the destruction of Jerusalem was the penultimate chapter of the tribulation. If the Revelation mostly describes the end time of the era before the kingdom of God arrived through the Lord Jesus Christ, in the first century, the destruction of Jerusalem was the penultimate chapter of the tribulation. It is generally a view held by preterists and postmillennialists and myself. Not only do secularists and scientists misunderstand critical portions of Genesis and the Revelation, so do millions of American Christians. That has profound political consequences today. The end of the universe is thus commonly misunderstood when it is applied to the Revelation. The kingdom of God is spiritual and may transcend the material world when or if it is God's will that it do so. When the Christian descended, when the church descended upon mankind as a new Jerusalem, a spiritual Jerusalem, in that period when the temple of the old Jerusalem was destroyed, God thereafter lived in the hearts and minds of those that are of the Lord's flock. Consider the nature of the kingdom of God and what it means. Theologians differ about it from gentry to chiliasts. One might expect that it is the most deep of subjects and fathomable in some respects, yet all are called and few are chosen. In a practical sense, the kingdom of God might be considered to be a circle at the center of which the Lord is calling people for the people of the world to enter. Not all hear the call, hence just the pre-selected that are chosen enter. The kingdom of God is spiritual within and without the individual, the divine Logos who took upon himself flesh as Jesus Christ is the way for humanity of the elect to enter eternal life with the Lord in the kingdom of God. Christianity is supposed to increase to become a majority of the world, so it may take thousands of years. When there are few unregenerated souls spiritually dead remaining on earth, the Lord will then return. The physical fate of the universe is somewhat of an ancillary curiosity for those interested in natural philosophy. Study of the cosmos is not an unproductive endeavor. Yet it is on the same practical foundation as farming is, except that one may try to learn more about the spirit, perhaps through quantum mechanical investigations of particle waves and fields. Maybe one may appreciate more about what spirit is by understanding what it is not, and then comprehending that spirit sustains even the most basic quanta of the universe. Christians will need to have rational scientific dialogue with the lost during the interregnum between periods of the Lord being physically present on earth. Christian missions work will benefit from deep competence in cosmology and may find the opportunity to bring more souls to the Redeemer with contemporary knowledge of physical theories, as a turbo apologetics perhaps. There are several ways that the reader may interpret written symbols. In fact, there are even emotional cues symbols give people that may subjectively vary in addition to experience subjectively applied to interpret objective symbols. Nature, too, has many ways that its history and nature may be interpreted by physicists, scientists, philosophers, mystics. In the course of this paper, I will present contrasting ideas to explain a given thematic objective object. It is hard for Christians to argue on technical points of quantum mechanics theory on the basis of scripture, where nothing was written about quarks, the strong force, etc. There may even be a fifth basic force of nature, or more. Einstein's special and general relativity theories, too have been confirmed to be factual in the way that Newton's mechanics were factual, though penultimate. There is nothing said in Genesis to confirm or rule out plural interpretative paradigmata for six days of creation, except that they seem to be nominal time phases prior to the creation of space-time mass. Energy, starting before then, energy in this particular universe, the Bible does not say that no other universes were ever made to exist, was created before the end of the first day in Genesis as well as cosmic Big Bang inflation theory. Subsequently, energy neither was created or destroyed. And that concludes this reading from my free ebook, God Cosmology and Nothingness.